sports is this going to be? You know, former tennis player Billie Jean King had once said, champions keep playing until they get it right. Well, today, like a true champion, battling the pandemic and the uncertainty surrounding it, Tiki2 has adapted to the new normal to come up with the 10th Global Sports Summit, Turf 2020, on a virtual platform. Besides, this is the platform that brings together sports personalities, policy makers, federation, the who's who of Indian and international sports industry to deliberate on profitable promotion and grassroots development of sports in the country. And so given the current challenging circumstances, this definitely is the need of the art. And what better, the summit this time also has India's first virtual global sports and fitness exhibition along with the International Conference on Business of Sports and the India Sports Awards. And for the inaugural session, we are privileged to have with us Honorable Minister sure. Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, Shri Kiran Rijiju, Honorable Minister, Department of Sports and Youth Welfare, Technical Education, Skill Development and Employment, Government of Madhya Pradesh, Shrimati Yashodhara Rajay Sindhya, and CEO Australian Olympic Committee, Mr. Matt Carroll, among other esteemed dignitaries. So, a lot to look forward for the next few days. On that note, could I now request Secretary General Thiki, Mr. Dilip Shanoi, to present the opening remarks. He's best known for being a change leader, and that reflects in all the endeavors that Piki has been coming up during this unprecedented crisis. Over to you, Mr. Shanoi. Thank you, Diksha. A very good morning uh, to all, and welcome uh, to the two day conference of business of sports and fitness of the 10th edition. Honorable uh, Minister Shilkiran Rijiju, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports Government of India. Honorable Minister, Department of Sports, uh, Youth Welfare, Technical Education, Skill Development and Employment, Government of Madhya Pradesh, Shimati Yashoda Rajesh Sindhya. Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, President Fiki, uh, Mr. Matt Carroll, CEO, Australian Olympic uh, Committee, um, and Mr. Amit uh, Bhalla from the Mark of Russia University. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. Uh, we also have adapted uh, presenting our green certificates virtually. Uh, so may I request uh, the certificate to be uh, presented to Sri Kiran Riju, the Honorable Minister of Youth Affairs and Sports Government of India. Virtual certificate, sir. We'll Honorable Minister, we'll we'll we'll. Uh, then can we present the next uh, certificate uh, to Shimati Yashoda Raja Sindhya, Honorable Minister, Department of Sports, Youth Affairs, Welfare, Youth Welfare, Technical Education, Skills Development and Employment, Government of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, to Matt, who is the CEO of Australian Olympic. Uh, okay. Uh, and to PV, uh, and we have the next one to Miss PV Sindhu. Thank you, Gaurav. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, with this, uh, may I now uh, request uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, President Fiki, and Joint Managing Director, Apollo Hospitals Group, to please deliver the welcome address. Dr. Sangeeta Reddy. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to those of you from in different parts of the world. And uh, Matt, uh, I, I acknowledge that. and. Uh, it is uh, indeed a pleasure to say namaste and to welcome all of you to declare open the 10th edition of TURF, the first virtual edition of a strategic game plan against a very worthy opponent, but one we're waiting to defeat very quickly, and that is the COVID pandemic. 
As president of FIKI, I have the honor to welcome the participants and panelists from all over the world who have come together to exchange experiences and to share their perspective and find ways to use this time to deliberate on what we can do soon when the world gets back to normal, to share your perspectives about the exciting field of sports and the next arenas of development. We have the privilege of holding our conference and exhibition on this well-equipped Made in Fiki platform, Bike, which is suitable for the current scenario and future. This change has forced upon us and has given us the opportunity to connect with global experts and regularly and fluently to understand what we can do best. I want to very importantly take this opportunity to welcome two extremely dynamic sports ministers amongst us, Sri Kiran Rijuju, Honorable Minister, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, is among one of the most inspiring leaders who's brought a culture of sports and fitness to the country. Srimati Yashodara Raje Sindhya Ji, Honorable Minister, Department of Sports, Youth Welfare, Technical Education, Skills Development and Employment of the Government of Madhya Pradesh, who successfully led the state sports in multiple terms and has been instrumental in changing the landscape of sports with her dynamism and envisages her state athletes adding to the country's medal tally very soon. Mr. Matt Carroll, CEO, Australian Olympic Committee. Thank you for joining us. And Ms. P.B. Sindhu, uh, one, someone who is very special to all, but also especially to me. She comes from Hyderabad, my home state, and uh, have known and watched her development with great pride. Uh, she's a globally renowned badminton player. All of you have come together to grace this event with your presence and enhance the profile of our event, but I think more significantly, to encourage our athletes to state with your presence the importance of sports and games and to bring to the forefront the fact that we will, as a country, be focusing much more on encouraging sports in schools, colleges, universities, and even as a profession. First, physical fitness is of the utmost importance, being from a healthcare field myself. So participation in these, uh, in um, when one is young, enhances good health and fitness. And as we are now talking about lifelong learning, it is equally important to talk about lifelong fitness, which is enabled in the most outstanding way through sports. Physical fitness and essential, is essential for proficiency in studies and for winning distinctions in examinations and ailing bodies do not make for sharp minds. And therefore this ability to slightly modify the Indian psyche about this unrelenting focus on academics and exams is I think an important aspect that we are in the, uh, in the journey of doing. And uh, honorable ministers and senior dignitaries, your presence here is one of the inspirations for youth, but also of parents to redefine the importance of sports. It's thrilling to know that fantasy sport industry has been actively working to develop, strengthen, and provide, provide meaningful impetus to the entire sports ecosystem. Uh, it is committed to creating impactful partnerships with the government and other organizations to help realize the true potential of sport. Uh, the industry is committing a corpus of 20 crores in the financial year 2021, and will be deploying an additional 50 crores in the year 21-22 to aid and facilitate the development of sports and the sports ecosystem in the country. We need many more initiatives like this, and we acknowledge uh, the magnitude of this gesture. Like every physical sport has an advantage, esports are essential to learning at the present time, and so much of the future is about the online world where they are actually living in a world of their own. So one needs to understand the importance of these figure out, decipher, and again, find a methodology to juxtaposition this with the real world in the right balance. Critical thinking to analyze and solve games are in a way a means to relieve stress and bring an enormous market for employment and some key benefits of esports are also being discovered, especially hand-eye coordination. I'd like to share with you that my son, who is in third year medicine in the UK, 
told me, mom, you used to grumble about all the time I spent playing video games, but now it's helping me uh, in my training skills as a surgeon. So who knows where this will go? Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the partners and speakers for their support, their guidance in putting this program together. I hope the discussions of the conference will help us put forward some strong re recommendations and ideas for development of a strong sporting culture in India. Concluding, I wish all of you a successful and an enlightening conference. I request you to visit India's first virtual global sports and fitness exhibition, which is available on the same platform online. Um, it is with great pleasure uh, and a lot of fondness that I welcome Srimati Yashodhara Sindhya, Honorable Minister of Development, Honorable Minister Department of Sports, Youth, Technical Education, Skill Development and Employment, Government of Madhya Pradesh for her keynote address. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Sangeeta. And uh, I see you in a new avatar as uh, the president of PICI. Uh, I've known your family for many, many years. And you girls have now, of course, women, have all been role models for people like us. That if you can do it, we can do it too. So we're very proud of you sitting in that chair today. And as I reminded Pankaj Singh, um, that we should not be put into gender brackets. He had me in one of the women's um, seminars and I said to him, I would like to do it, but I do not want to do it as because I'm a woman sports minister, so I'm going to opt out. So I'm um, happy said that. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And I look forward to having a good, healthy coordination between FIKI and the Madhya Pradesh DSYW. Um, also on this elite panel is uh, Mr. Amit Bhalla, who is the co-chairperson of the Sports and Youth Affairs Committee. And um, the biggest um, prayer now to me, as I call it, is having Mr. Kiran Rijiju on, um, on this webinar today, because singularly, he has been one of the first sports ministers, or I would say, after Rajivartan Rathor, who was himself a sports person, the singularly the most important person for sports in India. And he has converted that importance into doing and actioning things. So I'm very happy to have him here today. He and I were in Parliament and we had a very, very good productive time in Parliament together. On this panel is also Mr. Dilip Chinoy, Secretary General of FIKI, um, Mr. Matt Carroll, CEO Australian Olympic Committee, and of course, the great PV Sindhu, who I have known now from the years when she first started off because of her most wonderful role model coach, Mr. Gopi, as I call him. Without him, badminton would not have been nowhere. And he has produced the great Saina Nehwal and the great PV Sindhu. So I look forward to her comments later on. So where do I start? Um, given me the honor of this keynote address, but where do I start? Madhya Pradesh was never known for its sports. And truth to tell, until the Honorable Shivraj Singh Chauhan came to government as the chief minister, there really was not much happening in Madhya Pradesh. And at that particular point, he asked me and invited me to his cabinet, an honor, and he gave me the sports portfolio because he knew that I was passionate about sports. So this is where the, the story begins. And um, I'm putting it out there in front of you, uh, President Fiki, because people need to know the story so they can emulate the story and they can take it and multiply it a hundred times, which would be wonderful for sports. Uh, Madhya Pradesh was never known for sports. I wondered when I first came, where do I start? We had a budget of six crores, and six crores only paid the salaries. And therefore, I am highlighting the role of my chief minister because people say, oh, well, you know, he's a chief minister, so she's going to say something like this, but no. Six crores doesn't get you even peanuts, does not get you the kind of dreams that you envision to be putting down in the world. So, um, Every year I would approach him for more money and more budgets and uh, he would listen to me and he would 
give me the kind of budget I needed as a slow progression, even though it was a slow progression. And we started off this Madhya Pradesh uh, sports initiative by my thoughts in which I said, there has to be some exclusivity and then there has to be some inclusivity. So where is the exclusivity? The exclusivity is that I have to prove India wrong by saying that state departments of sports can also be the change makers. Up to now, when we talk about government initiatives, we're always, as people outside government, there's always a bunch of cynicism, Sangeeta, that goes with this. Oh, government, well, okay. But I want to prove this wrong. It was a very big challenge. And I said, okay, exclusivity would mean that I would set up academies as and when my uh, successes came about. And I would set up these ex uh, academies for maybe 40, 50 children. And um, it would be so exclusive as nobody else, no mummy ka beta hai, cha cha ki bhanji hai, kaka ka. You know, that, that setup, no political interference at all. So we started with this exclusive trust by having, in 2006, I was minister in 2005, December, so it meant 2006. In 2006, we started the Hockey Academy. And it was the Mahila Hockey Academy because I was a woman. And um, we had had no history of women hockey players in our, in our government, I mean, in our state. But yet we had Dhyan Chand, the great Dhyan Chand, who was from Madhya Pradesh, and the great Rup Chand, who was from Madhya Pradesh, Olympians. So I said to myself, I said, let me do this. Let me bring hockey back to where it was as center stage in Madhya Pradesh. So we started off with hockey. And today, in the last Rio Olympics, half the Indian team that had to qualify after 30 years, the Indian women's team qualified. And after 30 some odd years of qualifying, we had the Indian team, the women's team go. No, we did not win. But yes, half the Indian team was from my Mahila Hockey Academy, Gwalia. So that shows you that within 10 years, what one can produce if you really put a proper coach, give him the independence to do what he wants to do, give him the kind of upkram that is needed, that he needs, and give him total independence and, and an independent budget. So this is what we did, and you won't believe this, but we have produced something like 50 children who have got jobs in railways, CRPF, uh, Bina Oman Refinery, the Postal and Telegraph government. This is in the end what I wanted to do. I said to myself that if I'm producing exclusive academies, and if, if, the big if, we don't get the international recognition that we that I would like. At least the children will be so skilled that they can join government or private sector or whatever, and they can get jobs. So my end target always was from the beginning of this exclusive academies, skilling to the point of getting jobs. We did this in the Maida Hockey Academy. We did this in our water sports academies that we put up, which is sailing, rowing, kayaking canoeing and we got jobs within the army and the navy i remember the indian navy admiral chief coming to open up our academy and he said to me he said what are you doing in landlocked bhopal i said i have a beautiful lake and i know that in the end if i don't do too well at least my sailors will be skilled enough to join the navy and of course the army because now the army also has a number so I started with the three pillars, which is exclusivity of academies. And from the minor hockey academy successes, I went on to the men's hockey academy, where we created the young and famous Vivek Sagar, who led the Indian team over many successes uh, for the last five years. We then created academies for shooting, equestrian, fencing, boxing, you name it. And we've had several, several international medals on all fronts. And the second side of it was, um, inclusive. How do we get rural Madhya Pradesh to come forward and become a part of this trust? So it, it, it actually was a natural progression because the moment I started these exclusive academies, I needed uh, talent at the rural level and all our 
Bangalore went out into the rural level looking for talent and bringing them back. So most of these academies have, I would say, 80% Madhya Pradesh children and a component of 10 to 15% to 20% of children from outside. But most of them are from Madhya Pradesh. So I then fulfilled my own targets, which were the exclusivity and the inclusivity. And if I was going to do these two things to a, to a degree of international successes, then I would need infra as well as a sports science center. So in the infra, parallelly as I was doing these two, I put together 30 acres for the shooting academy, which has all three um, uh, vidhas, as we call it, disciplines, as we call it. Um, uh, I would say trap shooting, uh, skeet shooting, air rifle, air pistol, and um, skeet. All these we did, we have an equestrian academy, again, uh, Academy of Excellence, with 25 acres. We have a 50-acre international complex that we hope to bring up in Bhopal. We have 50 acres in Gwalior that we've just reserved for a Gwalior international uh, complex, so that when the Chambal Expressway comes through, from the Noida Expressway to Gwalior, we will have and can have all you people access these wonderful grounds that we are thinking of. So we put infra in everywhere. With that, we also wrote to the collectors saying, please, in every village, give us a small playground where we can hold our activities, whether it's simple Guli Danda or whether it's simple Koko or whatever it is, the village sport of that particular village, please give us land where every village will have its own little kill campus, little kill ground. Some gave me a lot, some gave me a little, and some gave me none. I did have collectors that still haven't given me any. But I don't get defeated by that. The, the premise is that you should try and get as many villages to have their own kill ground where the children can go and play. So this was the other thrust that we had, the rural thrust of where and how we can do it. The other thrust was that how can we make the summer and a coordination with the government of India? Because it's the government of India that has the policies and it's the government of India that has the funds. Be that as it may, we had we have Kiran Rijiju, who is now a sports minister. And I can show you how interesting, if you have a healthy coordination between the ministers, the two ministers, and then the two governments. What can happen? What wonders can happen? Because today, because of budgetary cuts, we approached Mr. Rijiju for our infra activities because now we're trying to spread out to the districts. I want to have road districts where we have an infra with a ground and inner campus and inner building, which will have, you know, table tennis, judo, wrestling, martial arts, everything that can be put inside a, inside a building. And then we have the outside grounds. And Mr. Rijenju has been very, very fair to us, extremely generous to us. And from the day he has come, you know, I always believe that if you have some achievements, then people will always give you. People who are visionary and people who are sports-minded will always uh, back up your success by saying, okay, these guys have done well, so let us give them money because we trust them. We know our money will be put to good use. And since nobody has the kind of money that you can just throw away, it is very important to prove yourself to the government of India so that you can continue to access funds. And that is why I would say I can give him a number of thank yous, but it will not be enough to Mr. Rijiju and his whole um, group of people that he has working under him. Having said that, what has COVID taught us? We have had all these number of successes, Sangeeta. Um, we have had the junior world record holder in air rifle. We have had uh, Harshika Tomar, a young sailor at 17. She is chosen by the main Olympic Federation to be in the Youth Olympics, a sailor. That to Madhya Pradesh, landlocked Madhya Pradesh. So, you know, these are victories. We have had the first Olympic record because in shooting you have to um, qualify. And so you have to, you, they have a series of competitions and you have to qualify at the international level and get an Olympic quota for your country. Once you get the Olympic quota for your country, again it's thrown open and then again it's, um, then again you have to compete. But she was the one who brought the Olympic quota for Madhya Pradesh and for India 
in El Pistol. And let me tell you, she was just an ordinary electrician in my stadium, his daughter. So when we talk about this big um, vision about how do we train our athletes and do all this, do you know, I have come to the conclusion in my 14 years that you just need, the talent is there. You just need proper coaches, you need proper infra, and you need proper equipment to give that. And the biggest thing, you need independence to the coach. Because these are all children that nobody had ever heard of. And these are all children that did not have great coaches. They just had regular coaches. So there again, if you have, you don't need to have an Olympian to be your coach. You just have to have a proper, dedicated, passionate coach. So we had um, Olympic coaches, we had junior world record holders in archery, where we have our archery academy in Jabalpur. We had the Asian team goal medalist. She was 16 years old, coming from our academy in Jabalpur. Her father is just an ordinary shopkeeper. So on one hand, we started having all these successes. So in all these successes, we suddenly realized we didn't have a sports science center. Today, if you come to our sports science center, you will see it is, I would say, one of the best, if not the best in India. And it has machines from all over the world with a good scientific doctors who know what they're doing. And I'm now going to come to COVID very quickly because I know my time is running out. When we got COVID, everybody fell flat on their faces because you know sports is something where if you have a lockdown, there's no way you can play. And where do my academies go? Where do my children go? Everybody went home. In that interim period, fortunately, I was not the minister. And when uh, the Shivraj government came back and I was a minister in July, I immediately activated things. And you won't believe this. This was the best thing that could have happened to me. You wonder why I'm saying that. It's because till then, we had never used the internet. We had never used the digital platform to reach out to anybody. And suddenly, we were being forced to do that. And that was one of the best things that happened because we reached out to the United States Olympic Committee. We reached out to doctors and sports science people all over the world. We reached out to universities like Loughborough University, which was a sports oriented university. We reached out to mental wellness people because we knew we needed our athletes to learn and understand how to deal with COVID. So we have gone to a point which is beyond any, any envisioned step. And I'm really happy to say that, uh, uh, you know, you can dream a hundred things, but you need people to put these dreams down into reality. As a, as a passionate a rider and a question. Uh, I, I used to compete in the national uh, competitions. In those days, no women would do that. I think there was only one or two other women. So you can have the passion and you can have the dreams and you can have the vision, but you need a department and you need good coordination with your directorate to be able to do that. And you also need good coordination with the government of India. Now, when I talk about the government of India, it is only not just Mr. Rijiju, but I'll I want to tell all those participants in this webinar, look at what happened. When we did our inclusive sports in the rural areas, we put together something called Grami Yuva Khel Abhyam. G-Y, Grami Yuva Khel, G-Y-K-A. And Mr. Manishankar Iyer was the minister, so I naturally went out to reach him to see whether I could get some access some money. And he loved what we'd done. Grameen Yuva Khel Abhyan immediately got taken by him as Paika, which they did with the Panchayat Yuva Khel Abhyan that they did, Paika. And then they took that, which was my little Yojana at Madhya Pradesh, and they took that to a pan India level, Paika. And do you know that Paika then gave birth to Khelo India? So it is little old Madhya Pradesh that started this whole movement. And therefore, it's a question of prayer now. How do we continue to inspire others to do the same? I want through you today, through Vicky, to use us as models, Sita, because I do believe that it is not the ones in the tools who will win us the Olympic They will. Abhinav Bindra did it without any government help. Rajavatan Rathor did it without any government help. But today, 
Just imagine if we today are getting international medals and we're a small little state that never had a history. Just imagine if any of the other states did the same thing and did it with passion and did it with vision. Can you imagine what that denominator would be? How we would be just having medals across the board and what Mr. Modi, our Honorable Prime Minister, wants more medals. That would be the denominator that would make those successes. And that is why I want to thank you for this opportunity because I'm not here to show off Madhya Pradesh. I'm here because this is a reality. And this reality needs to be copied by other states so that it can happen. Oh, doing it because I have a great chief minister in Ms. Patnaik. So they're already doing it and they've done a good job and they're getting medals now and they're getting traction. Let's see other states also. And so, you know, coordination with the government, infra, exclusivity, inclusivity, all these things come together. And It was a long time I had talked to the Australian ambassador to see uh, hockey in, uh, in Australia is one of the best. Hockey in Australia and Holland. And I had wanted to send my children there to practice and have some games there. Of course, uh, nothing came of it later. But through Mr. Carroll, maybe I could use his services to see some of my and move my children there to study and learn and come back. Uh, some sort of exchange program. Having said all this, I've taken too much time of yours. I just thank my department through you because, as I said, I can have a lot of dreams to operation, but to put it down, to put it in practice, requires a whole department's efforts from the principal secretary to my director. And just giving you a close off on this, I remember when I first started off, we have this thing where the police officer is our director because in the old days, policemen were supposed to be very fit. So I think that's how it started. But we had and started with a TIG rank director. And today, after 14 years, we have a DG ranked director. So that just shows you from a DIG to a DG level where the sports department has come. I particularly want to thank DG Sanjay Chaudhary through you, who was my director, ADG Upendra Jain, ADG Sujoy Thausen, and DG today, my Vartaman DG. Mr. Pavan Jain for all the work they've done and my principal secretary. Thank you for the opportunity. And one more session. This is your 10th edition of TERF. I want to congratulate Pankaj Singh and the whole group of people who put this together. But let us have a feedback from that. Let us understand what TERF edition does after it finishes. Do you have an analysis after every edition? Do you look at the outcomes after editions? Do you look at action taken after these editions? That would help us greatly. And we could all be able to put our minds and our hearts together to make a better sporting country. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. You truly stand testing me to the fact that how state sports departments can be change makers in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much for that address. Well, we are also privileged to have amidst us Mr. Matt Carroll, CEO, Australian Olympic Committee, with close to 30 years of experience in all aspects of sports administration. Uh, in fact, he originally comes from the construction industry, which is why he was also called Matt the Builder when he was Deputy Chief Executive at the Australian Rugby Union. For someone who's always known for getting things done, it'll be now my honor to request him to address this global summit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for that kind invitation about Matt the Builder. Um, but uh, thank you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> You've certainly done a bit of research there. Um, but good afternoon from Sydney, Australia, and uh, good morning, India. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to address the International Conference of Business, Sport and Fitness in particular uh, with the Honourable Ministers. And uh, I, hope, um, I hope I'm going to touch on the, the right aspects of which, 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 which you wish to hear. I think Australia and India both recognise the importance of sport to our communities, uh, not just the success of our respective great athletes, but the health, wellbeing and community building that sport brings. Um, as that great man Nelson Mandela said, sport has the power, power to change the world. Change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. 
And that's why it's so important that as sports administrators, policymakers, stakeholders, that we view our role as an opportunity to make a difference, not just in sport, but through sport. Uh, the overarching mission of the Olympic movement is building a better world through sport. So the AOC has, has 14 objectives you know, based on the Olympic Charter, uh, which only two directly relate to the Olympic Games. The other 12 are about placing sport at the service of the Australian community. Um, four years back, we pushed a, a reset button on our organisation and we recommitted to working to achieve all our objectives. Um, and this was, has given us the strength um, to face and get through this pandemic because we've repositioned our organisation. We we're able to manage our way through this pandemic. What we did is we defined our role, um, provide athletes the opportunity to excel at the Olympic Games and promote the values of Olympism and benefits of participation in sport to all Australians. And our vision is quite simply Australians inspired by the spirit of Olympic sport. Um, the AOC itself doesn't receive Australian government funding for our own operations, but we do advocate on policy programs and funding on behalf of all our 45 member sports. Um, we believe the sport has a vital role to play in promoting national health and wellbeing, uh, building national pride, community spirit and social cohesion, as well as promoting a positive image for Australia internationally. Um, early introductions there, you touched on the importance of education, um, so the importance of uh, sport in schools and in universities and other colleges of education. We absolutely agree with that. And there's a lot of research that we have been doing with some of the, uh, the uh, universities and schools on the connection between academic success and sport participation. Um, and that, that, that is a, uh, a position the AOC is particularly pursuing with government. As one of um, only two countries to send teams to every Olympic Games in the modern era, uh, one of our major and most cherished obligations is obviously to provide Australian athletes with an environment to perform at their best in Olympic competition. So how does that look in, in action? Apart from obviously a lot of planning in, into getting our athletes to the Games, we also provide direct assistance to um, individual summer and winter athletes, financial support to, based on their performance, uh, over the course of the uh, of the quad to defray the cost of competing in their chosen sports at home and abroad. Um, we also provide some direct funding to a number of our Olympic sports. And as I said, we advocate to government to support our Olympic sports through the, through the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, by having a, a strong, you know, Olympic, uh, strong group of Olympians competing at the Games, it allows us then to do an important other part of our, our work, which is delivering community-based programs um, into schools uh, in particular. Uh, we have two programs which we're particularly proud of. One's called Olympics Unleashed, which engages school-aged children in the life journeys of Olympic yeah. athletes. So what we do is Olympians go into the classroom and tell their story. They tell their story about how they've trained, how they've prepared, how sometimes they've failed and had to pick themselves up again. So that helps build resilience and helps uh, valuable lessons in goal setting and self-awareness. So it's not easy. Uh, life isn't easy, and if you want to be, uh, strive to be an Olympic athlete, then it, you have to put the effort in. Um, our program has rolled across mainly Australian primary schools, but some secondary schools. And in the last 18 months, 150,000 students have heard the story from Olympians um, or would-be Olympians, some who may who are still uh, trying to get to the, the Tokyo Games. Another particular program we're proud of is the Australian Olympic Changemaker Program, where we recognise students who demonstrate leadership through sport or use sport as a vehicle to improve the health and wellbeing in their school community. And obviously both of these programs have been online in a digital sense over during the pandemic. And um, as the Minister said, it's been so important to adapt to technology um, and during the pandemic, and that's exactly what we've done as well. Um, during that, this time, we also particularly focus on Australian Olympians providing opportunities to further their careers outside of sport uh, through education, employment, mentoring, opportunities to make a positive contribution to the Australian community. Um, our Athletes Commission is very important to us. Um, it's elected by the athletes and one and the chair of the Athletes Commission sits on our board as well. And they give us advice um, on all things from an athlete's perspective because it's very important to understand from the athlete's perspective the decisions that you're making uh, for the Australian Olympic Committee. Uh, we cooperate with government and non-government bodies, but we maintain 
our independence, uh, but we work well with our federal and state governments. Um, again, as the minister was saying, it's so important the the, uh, the working together between um, the, the AOC and our sports and our governments uh, at both the state and uh, federal levels, particularly in the areas of health uh, and in education. And the combination of those two um, is vital. Um, Australians have a special regard uh, for their Olympians. Uh, the Olympic Games are still, you know, in terms of ratings on TV and things of that nature, the most loved sporting event, um, even ahead of the major sporting events, even ahead of cricket, dare I say, in Australia, uh, the Olympic Games uh, come, comes through. Um, with this support, we've built a strong commercial program, um, obviously important to fund the Australian Olympic Committee of sponsors who are not just sponsoring the team, but they're also sponsoring those those school and community programs I was talking about too. So that means the sponsors aren't just there for the, the, the two weeks of the Olympic Games, they're there for the whole four years between games. Um, an important part of uh, our commercial partnership has been building our digital relationship with our fans and the broader Australian community. Um, understanding our fans, um, they want to hear directly from athletes. The athletes are so important to, uh, to uh, bringing more fans and the involvement um, of them into, into the games. The athlete story is the most powerful piece we find on, in, in, in our digital programs. Um, this, this work is important for the commercial strength of our sponsors, sponsors particularly during this pandemic where you couldn't do anything live, everything had to be virtual, so our digital program was critical. Um, it's also in, equally important to building a strong bond with the Australian community. We um, also, you know, I often say to my team here at the Olympic Committee, um, we actually don't create the athletes, we don't train the athletes, They're, they are done by our sports, our member sports, whether it be hockey, rugby, uh, weightlifting, sailing, whatever, swimming, whatever the sport may be. And so it's important for us to have a very strong connection and relationship with our member sports. And, and that's what we've done over the last few years. And that's very important to ensure that we have a cohesion then when the uh, Australian Olympic team is assembled um, later next year. Um, I'm sure 2020, and I agree, is probably one of those years we'd all like to forget. Um, but I think we'll just leave the commentary to the historians. Um, we're looking ahead forward to 2021. Our focus is on Tokyo, uh, the games of the 32nd Olympiad. Um, we'll be taking um, about 500 athletes and almost the same number of coaches to the game. So about a thousand Australians uh, to Tokyo. Um, and I can very proudly say we will be taking more female athletes than male athletes to the games for the first time. Last time it was balanced, but now there are more female athletes than male athletes in the Australian team. So our job is to ensure that they can prepare well um, in this COVID environment and get them there safely to compete. We're absolutely certain that the games are going ahead. Uh, the Japanese are doing a magnificent job, the organising committee, at getting Tokyo ready, and uh, we're, we're very sure it'll be a most inspiring game games. Um, you know, measuring of that success, yes, it can be by medals. Um, they're very rare. Uh, there's not too many medals that get, get, get won. Um, but also by athletes reaching the games and competing, uh, being the best they can be. Um, if an Australian made the 100 metres uh, you know, uh, race in the, in the men's or women's, that would be an inspiration to all Australians um, because it's a very hard event to get to the top at. Um, yes, we, we, we win medals in some sports, we, we struggle in others, but that struggle in itself is an inspiration. And, we're, and that sort of circling back to what the message we give to the schools, uh, through to the students, is that, yes, you may not totally succeed in what you want to do, but you've got to have a go, or as Australians would say, have a crack. Um, as I said, we're absolutely sure the Tokyo Games will take place It'll be an outstanding game. So I think it'll be a game that's going to reconnect the world. And I think that's where the important the Olympic movement can do. Um, and sport can and will play an important role in rebuilding and reinvigorating our communities in India, in Australia, as we emerge from the pandemic. I think you know we know that sport will deliver health and well-being to children, to students, and even to older people. Um, you know, there, there's a uh, well, one of our oldest Olympians going will be 64. Um, in the sport of equestrian. Um, and even the other day, there was a tournament here in Australia, a table tennis tournament. There was a 100-year Australian male who got beaten by a 98-year-old Australian woman um, in, a, uh, in a table tennis uh, competition. So even for the, for the older ones, you know, even people like myself getting on in years. Um, 
then our Olympians, so yours and ours, you know, delivering all the, the important message of inspiration, the motivation that comes from years of hard training to inspire our youth, not just to be Olympians, of course, but to be the best they can be, whatever they choose to pursue. And I think, you know, just if I pick up some of the points there, totally support the importance of coaching. Coaching is so critical to any sport. You, countries have talent. They're always going to have talented athletes, but having really good coaches to bring that talent on, to give them the opportunity to succeed in their particular sport is so critical. And it's something which we, we talk to our Institute of Sport about. We'd be happy to coordinate any exchanges with our Australian Institute of Sport to support the academies um, in India. So please, uh, please make contact with me. I think India and Australia share the same passion for sport and often for the same sports. And uh, sometimes we win, sometimes you win, and, but it's always a great, a great, a great uh, competition. We enjoy the competition. We enjoy the rivalry, um, the inspiration and the opportunity to draw our two countries closer together through sport. So thank you. And Ma, I wish you well for 2021, a year which is going to be a, a lot better than 2020, but bring it on and bring it on soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I think uh, very rightly said, life isn't easy and you need to put in efforts. I'm sure your message would uh, absolutely inspire a lot of athletes who are listening to you right now. Uh, well, uh, could I now request our Honourable Minister, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Sri Kiran Rijiju ji, to release uh, to knowledge papers here we are it's a virtual platform i know but we are still doing this and we are privileged to have with us the honorable minister shikirin Dichiju. so i'll request him to first uh, release a knowledge paper on sports law and policy in present global scenario by black Evid publishing house edited by avinash singh subrajit chandra and sebastian as we can see our honorable minister holding it thank you so much sir uh, well, through this paper, we can access a modest range of research and knowledge resources on all critical subjects of sports law. And the second one is uh, India, the next global sporting manufacturing hub, India 3.0 by IISN. Thank you. Thank you to our Honorable Minister once again. Well, we have with us Mr. Nilesh Kulkarni, the director IISM. In fact, I can quickly request him to speak a few words about uh, this paper. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Honorable Minister uh, Sri Kiran Rijiju, sir. Uh, Honorable Minister uh, Yashoda Rajay Sindhyaji from Madhya Pradesh. Uh, Chair, co-chair, Dr. Bhalla, secretary, and the entire committee. It is indeed an honor and a privilege uh, to have worked with Fiki for the last uh, four years, releasing almost uh, one paper every year. And we are happy that as an institute, our endeavor throughout our journey is to make sure that the report and the primary data, which is part of that report, is generated through our students who do extensive work to generate this report. And my entire academic team is working tirelessly to make sure that this report gets uh, generated and published uh, on the FIKI platform, which indeed is extremely happy for us to have this kind of platform given an opportunity to my team and my students of ISM who are working in this particular space. So it is a wonderful opportunity. I hope we've done justice to the expectations FIKI has uh, empowered upon us. And year on year, our numbers getting referred by the sports industry people for the development phase within the industry. It was heartening to see uh, uh, Yashodra ma'am actually addressing the development in the Madhya Pradesh. And we are happy as an institute that there are some reports which we tried to do primarily and would be interested in taking care of these kind of initiatives, making sure we contribute towards the development of sports in states as well as in India. Once again, I thank the entire FIKI committee for giving us the opportunity to ISM to create this support we extend wholehearted support to Pankaji and the entire team of Fiki for any any uh, expectations they have from ISM. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to have this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kulkani. Uh, may I now also request the Honorable Minister Shikiran Rijijuji to now virtually inaugurate India's first virtual global sports and fitness exhibition. All right. Uh, 
Thank you. So, like, like uh, you could, yes, see that virtual platform, but the efforts put in are all real, and that uh, marks the virtual inauguration of the first virtual global sports and fitness exhibition. Thank you. Well, we now have a very special dress by ace badminton player MSPV Sindhu, the Olympic medalist who etched her name in the history books by clinching a gold medal at the BWF World Championship last year, is currently preparing for the Asian leg of the BWF tour in January next year in London. And that's where she sent the message from. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, good afternoon. As an Indian athlete, it's always been a huge honor and motivation to have the continuous support and backing of Fiki during the course of my career. I would like to thank them for giving me this opportunity to speak at one of the biggest global sports summits, Turf 2020. As a sports person and someone who understands, lives and reads sport 24 into 7, I'm really delighted that such summits have become common around the globe and in our country because it gives people the chance to discuss the key areas we need to address and talk about and also to sit down, comprehend, brainstorm and formulate some important policies and ideologies which will benefit the various stakeholders in the world of sports, including athletes, organizers, officials and most importantly, the fans. I think sports have the ability to change the world. We've always seen how it creates and builds unity within people and how it can help people overcome various challenges and adversities of their lives. I've been fortunate to have reached the very top of the sporting pyramid during the course of my career. But one thing that I've always focused on is that you cannot guarantee anything in any sport. The first minute you could be on the top, but the very next minute you can be falling down as well. So even though sports is a great leveler, it is also something that brings joy and passion to people around the world. We've heard about numerous legends of the sporting arena who have overcome adversities and difficulties and have then been given almost a new life in a way. A new life which has probably given them everything, not just from a financial point of view, but also from the love and confidence you get when you are adored by thousands and lakhs of people across the world. It is a feeling like no other and sport has that power. When I also say it is a great leveler, I mean that sport can help keep people down to earth as well. I know that if I don't work hard, Day in and day out, I could be beaten up by someone who is doing that. So, sport teaches you a lot from being disciplined in every aspect to maybe even understanding what trust means. For example, when you are playing a team sport, you need to have that trust on your teammate and your coaches as well. And only then a team can succeed. So, there's so many ways and so many such factors and qualities you learn from sport. And not just that, but not just the athletes who actually play, even coaches and the fans, everyone learns so much, which can also apply to your normal daily lives. Sometimes when I've got time to sit down and probably look back at my career and all the choices that I've made and the journey that I've had, I wonder what it would have been had I not taken a badminton, for instance. I would have been a scholar maybe, who would have been unknown to the world, living in my hometown, interacting with limited people and maybe not even being familiar with a lot of things I've gotten to learn through my career and through my sport. I might also have turned out to be the person I am today also might have not been able to help people in my sport. The youngsters coming through who asked me for advice, 
but also not have had the honor of being able to donate to the less fortunate. So food for thought. But it is something I usually wonder when I look back at my career and feel grateful for my life that I've been fortunate enough to live. Another point of view for an Indian athlete is the kind of troubles and hesitancy that's associated with choosing any sport as a career option. I feel we've all got a responsibility to fulfill where we encourage young people and their parents to get past the stigma that sport is not a viable career option. We've been highlighting the sentiment for more than a decade now. I remember when Abhinav won the gold in Beijing. That was the time when parents thought about other sports than cricket. Maybe. So definitely, I think it's high time we go on and formulate pathways for our youngsters that they are able to continue following their dreams and can have the support of their parents as well. I think growing up, I've had similar experiences because badminton wasn't a huge when I was obviously my parents were a bit apprehensive but I think their understanding and support only led me here. There were of course doubts about having an undecided and unsecure future and then the social dilemma but you've seen how it all changed once after I bagged the silver in Rio. I think what I've realized is that as much as it is a societal thing, it is also the athlete's responsibility to deliver at the biggest stage. And only then people will talk about you. It is the hard truth of any sport anywhere in the world. You only end up hearing about athletes who achieved so much. You don't hear about the ones who could not. But what I want to tell the parents who are listening to me is that people don't start playing any sport to become a billionaire or being afraid of the consequences or of failure. You start because you love doing it and because you're good at it. Similarly, if you see your child is great at art or at painting and loves painting, then you should put him or her into an art school. And that should apply to every child and every little passion you have. Especially at a time in Indian history where we've got so many career options for our youngsters. Earlier, it used to be an engineer, doctor, banker, and that's it. But now you've got a whole new dimension of careers, even in sport. Earlier, it would be chess cricket. Now you see we've got world-class athletes coming through in almost all sports. It is definitely a positive change in Indian sport industry that I've seen during my time. And I'm absolutely delighted for our future generations because they will have something even better to look forward to as an Indian sports person. And most of the credit for it goes to how grassroots is managed and developed in the country. We've almost and also got great infrastructure in different parts of the country and with the private sector also investing in Indian sports. Athletes across sports have reaped the rewards for their performances. You look at all mainstream sports having their own leagues now, badminton, football, kabaddi, tennis, volleyball, cricket obviously. Even hockey used to have one. Then you hear about other sports also contemplating having their own leagues so that it is amazing as a youngster. You look at how the lifestyle of an average Indian athlete has changed and improved. You will understand how far we've come and much of credit for it goes to our investors and sponsors who are always there for us, who are supporting you and give you the best possible environment to prepare yourself for your tournaments. I believe if we keep doing these things right and with the backing of the respective federation, sponsors, authorities, we can keep going further and we can one day become a sporting powerhouse as well. And for me, that is a thought with which I go into my tournament as well. Personally, I've been preparing for the Olympics as well with that same mentality.
I know that if I win something for my country again, people from all walks of life will come forward to support me, my sport and even other such sports. It is a thought that it is a bit prevalent in my mind and going forward, I would definitely want to contribute to Indian sports and take it to the next level. I will be following the whole summit with keen interest and I'm also open to more suggestions, ideas and potential changes. If they help and if they can help make Indian sporting industry a better one. Once again, thanks to Fiki for having me at Turf and I look forward to being present there for real once we all are through with this pandemic. Till then, I hope you all take care of yourselves and have a great couple of days of brainstorming sessions. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for that lovely address. So uh, moving on, before I take this opportunity to request uh, him to present the inaugural address, I would like to use this platform on behalf of the entire Fiki family to thank Honorable Minister Sri Kiran Rijiju, who has infused new energy to new India's lofty goals to be a global sports powerhouse. Under his command, the country is bringing in a series of reforms that would change the way sports is being played in our country. He leads by example, and he has also given a new direction to the Fit India campaign of Prime Minister Shinarindra Modi, who gave the clarion call of fitness car doors, Adha Ghanta Rose. Only on Monday, he unveiled the Fit India Cyclothon, which would be held across each district of the country, and citizens can participate and share their story of fitness. It is indeed an honor for me to now request Honorable Minister Youth Affairs and Sports Government of India, Shri Kiran Vijijuji, to present the inaugural address. Over to you, sir. Namaskar. Thank you very much. First of all, my greetings to the friends in India, from Australia, from other countries who have joined this very important conference organized by FIKI, my dear colleague, the Sports Minister of Madhya Pradesh, Srimuthi Yashodhara Raja Sindhyaji, President of FIKI, Dr. Sangeeta Reddyji, CEO Australian Olympic Committee, Mr. Matt Carroll, Mr. Arit Balla, who is the co-chair, Sports and Youth Affairs Committee of FIKI, Mr. Dilip Chinoy, Secretary General, FIKI, all the learned panelists, participants, friends. Indeed, it's a wonderful moment for me to join FIKI once again uh, for this very important TURF 2020 conference. I believe this is very critical and very important for uh, India and for the world of sports. I've always been very enthusiastic about participating an event organized by FIKI. Yashodharaji and we went to USA on FIKI's platform some long time back when we were together members of parliament with Mr. Amit, I think Amit, uh, the uh, present finance minister of uh, West Bengal. Uh, Amit Mitra. Uh, he was, I think, uh, General Secretary, Secretary General of FIKI that time and uh, we had a wonderful time so I have a long association with uh, FIKI for uh, various occasions and for sports. FIKI has been wonderful and it's always uh, good to uh, partner and associate with those groups and associations and individuals who have a passion for the sports. Uh, I will not talk about all technicalities and too much of about the policies, but I will just try to uh, give my personal touch, my personal outlook about how to make India a fit nation, a sporting nation. Uh, before that, just quick, quickly to mention that we have to ensure that sports becomes a big industry in India. Many people may not just realize the importance of sports. It can be a huge contribution to the GDP of a country. Imagine if the entire nation is involved in sporting activities. The dynamic energy of a nation, its population, if everybody is playing or involving or encouraging, 
the GDP jumps by 20-30%. It's unimaginable energy which people normally do not recognize. Sports is a huge industry. It creates huge jobs. And, and besides that, the energy it gives to the nation as a whole. That is why we have thought about creating a fit nation and to make India a great sporting powerhouse. Now, when I say let's make India a fit nation or a great sporting powerhouse, it will not become just like that. When I was given this uh, responsibility of youth affairs and sports, I had a discussion with Prime Minister. So Prime Minister Modiji had very clear vision. He said, Hello India must become a way of life. It must reach nook and corner of the country. And let us make India a fit nation. So I'm running a parallel uh, government initiative, Hello India and Fit India movement. Besides that, all other activities are going on. It has been going on. We are going to uh, increase the pace of all the activities. But these two big parallel programs are going very strong even during this pandemic also we have not stopped the activities it has gone in virtual mode athletes are not idle they are sitting at home but they are connected they are trained they are acquiring knowledge they are well on course with their regular training so we are creating certain mechanisms uh, by using the digital uh, technology and so many things in the midst of this, I know Fiki has already done many things during pandemic to encourage and to continue with the sporting activities and to impart uh, knowledges, informations, and basically for the education. So when when I I see that India has a potential, so potential on its um, own has no meaning. Potential is just good to talk about. How to realize the potential. So, we have to first make the citizens <coughs> pro sports, pro fitness. We can't, we can't talk about a prosperous India with uh, citizens being unfit. We cannot talk about creating a sports culture without success in the sporting arena. These are so important. So, I thought. While we are doing so many important policies and programs, but let us inculcate this sporting culture in the minds of people. Many people come to me without understanding that, oh, cricket is so important, cricket is so much of a, you know, money there, rich board and all, cricketers are getting money and all. Why government is not supporting other sports? So I tell these people, before you put this question to the minister or the government, you put this to yourself. How, what is your contribution for sports? Out of 1.3 billion population in India, if 800 million people are watching cricket, it is natural. The cricket will become rich. Money will go where the viewership is. Money will go where the stadiums are packed. Any industrial house is ready to invest crores of money if, if uh, millions of people are watching that particular game. Now, if we uh, conduct a football, if you are, can't fill up even 10% of the seats, how will, how will money come? Last time when I had a meeting with, uh, I will not name, it, it might be controversial, but I had a meeting with the uh, Sports Federation. So we were talking about hosting the uh, World Championship in India. So when I asked them, they said, no, no, they will not host in Delhi because in Delhi, they don't get crowd. So they want to host in a particular city where the stadium will be filled with crowds. See, why this opinion has come, we have to realize that. Why we are not a sporting country? I, I can tell you there is no lack in terms of government support presently under Narendra Modi's government. We are doing everything. I will come to that a little bit later. But the thing is, government's effort alone is never enough. It is going to be the people's effort, people's participation, which defines a success. So if everybody watches Kabaddi, Kabaddi will become popular. If everybody goes to athletic stadium, the athletes will become popular. If you watch uh, football, Go to soccer stadium or watch a soccer game in the television. It will become 
a popular sport. You create hero out of people's participation. The, a hero is not evolved on its own. It is the people who make a hero. If people recognize, then it is recognition by the country, by the government, by everything. So that is why India is a huge country. Even if 2% of India's population watch a particular sport, that sport will naturally become popular because our population is so much. What is the population of UK? Uh, close to six, as close to 60 million. So that is less than 5% of India's population. That means if 5% of India's population watch a particular, particular game, it will become more than UK's population. It will become more than viewership you have in UK. So that will bring money. That will bring all the resources. It's very simple. So that is why I have thought about creating a sports culture in the way of your daily life. So that is why the new education policy talks about sports and fitness activities as part of the whole education system. Education, keeping aside isolating sporting fitness is not education I've been telling before. If you have no fitness mentally, physically, you are nowhere. What is the brain about if it is not existing in a fit body? We say, you know, swast sharir mein hi, uh, swast mansikta basta hai. If, if you are not physically and mentally fit, the knowledge itself will mean nothing. So this, that is why we have to create a fit society. We have to have sports as a way of life. Everybody will not become champion. But nobody stops you from playing. At this age, Kiran Rijiju is not going to play for India. But I can play for myself. I can play for my society, for my own self. I shall create sports culture. So that is why we are talking about reaching out to every nook and corner, taking the spirit of Hello India. The whole nation should play. In Western world, in a sporting nation, a house is not complete without a sporting facility. A housing society is not complete without a sporting arena or sporting complex. Sports complex, sports facility, fitness gym or whatever, any facility you can do it. That is why the Prime Minister's vision of Hello Indian Fit India movement is, I think, taking a shape. And FIKI and many other organizations are playing very important part in the whole journey. So, while I am targeting, like coming Tokyo 2020 Olympics, I was very happy to hear from our Australian friend, uh, Mr. M Matt Carroll. He is the CEO of Australia, Australian Olympic Committee. Australia has a very good history of sporting culture and they have done very well in Olympics, especially in swimming and some of the events. Australia is good. Now, we, we in India, we have to understand, we are a big nation. We are close to 17% of the world population. And we are on top of that a young nation. So the expectation from India is huge. We can't afford to celebrate with one or two medals alone. Each medal is important, but one, two medal is not uh, according to the standard and what India deserves. That is why I have set a very, very ambitious target of putting India in the top 10 ranking by 2028. Now, many people will question, but I will not uh, talk about that in detail because there is uh, no that much of luxury of time. But I can say that when I said by 2028, Los Angeles Olympics, India will be in top 10, I have made a detailed, extensive preparation for that. And that I will talk some other day, some other time. What is the preparation on my target 2028 to, to put India in the top 10 ranking? That is there. But right now, what I'm doing is, when I talk about sports culture, I must do something as a minister. I have a responsibility. Just uh, making a slogan and talking and giving target is not enough. So what I have done is small, small things. These small things are very critical and very important to make sports as a viable option. Not only as a career, but it gives you dignity, it gives you honor, it gives you a platform. It's a way of life and it also gives comfort to your life. So, 
some of the policies which I have made changes, these are people may say small changes, but for me, these are critical and important changes. We may not see in the newspaper headlines, our sports uh, editors or the, the sports correspondents of various uh, channels and uh, news prints and all, they may be, they are writing very well, but the, the main editor or the main story creator in the uh, media, they may not be making it headline. Because in a very obsessive uh, in politics in India, it doesn't get space. So India is a politically obsessive society where controversial things and political things, all other things take the headline space. But where important steps taken for the welfare, which, which can create critical changes and impact, are not getting the headlines and space in the news. That is why people do not come to know about what changes and what steps we have taken. I have done so many welfare schemes for the retired athletes, but still some of the athletes still call me, ask me, sir, please give me some benefits. I am in the hospital or uh, says my brother who played for India is in hospital, dire need of financial assistance, please do something. Whereas these are already been in last one and a half year, we have put up this in the website and so many things are done that any player who has represented India, who has not only won medal, but you know, maybe in some, some uh, not even as a player, may have associated with game, may have contributed to sports, even not as a player, but as a technical staff, will also be supported. These are kind of things we have done to encourage the sports person and the sporting fraternity. But these are informations not reaching out to the people because this doesn't make news. It, it is not a news story. So that is why we have to make it sporting op obsessive society. We have to be obsessive about sporting culture, sporting news, sporting achievement, rather than too much obsessive about politics. Politics is there, we are a democratic nation. But at the same time, welfare steps, welfare measures initiated by the government must get the coverage. So that is why uh, many people say that oh, uh, our uh, other sports players are not being recognized, they are not being widely covered, uh, only cricketers are being covered in the news. Otherwise, I can't force the newspaper whom they should carry the story about. These are independent. Minister cannot dictate the news, uh, print media or electronic media to carry a particular news. So it is the citizens who will have to decide. Suppose if there is a tournament or a, a, a kabaddi match or a football match in Nehru Stadium, which has a capacity of 70,000 people, if that stadium is packed with the audience, I'm telling you, Immediately, any corporate house will be ready to invest or sponsor any amount of money if that stadium is packed with the audience, the spectators. So this is a simple funda. That is why when I have visited some of the uh, sporting facilities, even this uh, uh, during the pandemic also, I have interacted with many sports person. Whether it's international sport person like PB Sindhu or uh, our uh, Olympic medalist Mary Com or uh, Marika Batra or Rani Rampal, known athletes, even I have intensely interacted with unknown faces, even with the junior players, so that they should feel that their minister sports is very much standing with them. I have changed the uh, the total system of providing better food, better diet to the athletes. I have removed the, the categories and the, the whatever quota system. Let the athlete, let the player eat whatever they have to eat, whatever their, their coaches, their, uh, their nutritionists tell them to eat, whatever is required by their body. Then I have removed the salary structure, I have already created lots of changes with the system. Now, Indian coaches cannot be limited with two lakhs and less payment. This was a rule made long time back that Indian coaches will not be paid more than two lakhs. I immediately remove all this kind of uh, unnecessary uh, policies which are very diminishing. We, we will get best coaches in the world, but we will also have to create best coaches within Indian coaches. So. 
because we are talking about atman nirbhar bharat we will take help wherever it is required but we will have to be self reliant some day and that is why small small policies selection starting the tops junior we have started already tops junior 25000 per month we are depositing into the account of the junior athletes 9 years old 10 years old 12 years old they are the future champion and also we are now trying to work with the uh, larger groups so now since i am i am uh, with the fiki my my request is that let us work together in this direction where the business houses the corporate houses own certain athletes or certain sports we have already given a letter to all the state governments to choose one or two sport of their choice their preferences so let us treat 38 states and union territories in india as one unit each still like madhya pradesh it's bigger than most of the countries in the world so let us let each state and union territory treat one or two sport as as priority and they can do the on their own suppose madhya pradesh yashodra ji has already given preferences we are going to provide financial assistance technical support and everything to madhya pradesh to develop that particular sport besides that madhya pradesh can do on their own many things that the state has the liberty and freedom but government of india will focus on certain thing focus doesn't mean that we will not support other sports we will support but we will give priorities to each sport for example ladakh ladakh will have to take care of ice hockey or something winter sport like jammu kashmir will look after the winter sports or or jammu kashmir has a good football culture in the same manner goa west bengal can north east india can uh, think about uh, football and all rajasthan can think about shooting many things each state like haryana can talk about wrestling so each state has its own unique potential that also we have to identify at the same time the state has its own freedom to take up any new sport or develop other sports so what i wanted to say is there are certain things which are small changes which will help in and contribute in creating a sports culture in india i don't want to see any sports person suffering remember if a if a sports person suffers it discourages the generation i have seen some of the sports person who played for india but who are struggling to lead a normal dignified life nothing can be more discouraging than that for the younger generation to take up sports as a way of life if you play for india and you end up suffering your life how will this encourage the next generation that is why we from the corporate world from the government we have to come together to ensure that our sports persons are well taken care of today fortunately anybody who is under preparation in in the national camp have no complaint we are going to create a better three star standard hostels for our international athletes in india we have taken a decision and we will implement it soon in a in a first we will start from the national center of excellence in patiala or gwalior or or in a uh, bangalore trivandrum guwahati kolkata we have so many uh, centers in india but we will begin from some center and we will do it and then we are ensuring that the prize money all the financial support everything from the government go and reach out to the athletes totally uninterrupted on the spot they must reach uh, they must reach it to the to the designated beneficiary at the same time uh, we are also starting 1000 kilo india small center across the country all those who have already played in the past some role in the sports they will all get employment they will all get some kind of a, a you know role in shaping the sports culture different ministries have also been uh, uh, advised from my ministry that we will pool in together all the resources which we have i have so many things to share but i feel that since you are going to have a very lengthy uh, conference and i could see a uh, lots of interesting uh, thing you are going to discuss about uh, you have this amazing top 
topics uh, about um, uh, uh, all these uh, skilled speakers are going to talk about uh, upcoming Olympics, women in sports, government's roles, science and technology. Sports science is so critical. We are also taking some steps on that. And I also see how, you know, fantasy sports is filling sports consumption. Very important. This online fantasy sports is very instrumental in revolutionizing the manner in which sports enthusiasts engage with their own respective favorite sports. In the same manner, uh, you know, uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, full faith in the uh, topics which you have chosen and the experts who are going to take part in the whole uh, uh, conference. This will be very, very much beneficial to the sports industry, to the sports world and for, for India as a whole. And I congratulate and thank Fiki for promoting Fit India very actively. And these days, all the um, uh, Fiki people are looking very fit. I think they all are doing lots of uh, fitness activities. So it encourages us. Look at the Prime Minister Modi ji. He's so fit and he's so energetic. There's nothing called tiredness, laziness in his dictionary. He keeps working uninterruptively, non-stop. He keeps working. And in the same manner, I also try to remain fit as a sports minister. I can't afford to be unfit. And also, uh, last time when we had a Fit India Freedom Run, uh, Fiki had made a very significant contributions in the success of the Fit India Freedom Run. We are going to launch many more right now. Uh, uh, Fitness ka dose, Aadha Ganta Rose, the Prime Minister's court, these are happening. And look forward to participate together. Fiki, as always, as I said, uh, very forthcoming in uh, uh, not only supporting, but taking forward any kind of uh, important government programs. So I'm very happy, thankful to the entire team for organi organizing this uh, conference. And thank you for um, inviting me also. My best wishes to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for those kind words. And sir, irrespective of the headlines, we are sure under your dynamic leadership, sports and fitness would definitely become a way of life for every citizen in India. Thank you once again, sir. Uh, could you. I now request Dr. Amit Bhalla, co-chair FIKI Sports Committee and vice president Manav Rachna Education Institution to present the vote of thanks. Thank you, Adiksha. I would like to thank uh, Shri Kiran Rijijuji, Minister of Youth Affairs and Sports, for his ever encouraging and energetic words towards building India as a sporting nation. Sir, your message is very clear towards the responsibility of every citizen, his role in building a sporting nation, how we can contribute towards increasing GDP and how we can contribute towards making our country as a fit and a prosperous country. Thank you very much for your kind words today, sir. I would also like to thank Madam Yashodra Sindhyaji for sparing her time and sharing her journey for building Madhya Pradesh as a sports power hub. It's very encouraging to see a passionate minister who knows the length and breadth of sports and has created a team towards nation building. I would like to thank Mr. Matt for sharing his journey with us, the true spirit of Olympic sports and Olympism and the way Australia used sports for community development and building the sporting culture in Australia. I would also like to acknowledge Ms. P.V. Sindhu for her message. That's a very clear message on sports as a teacher, how sports can be used as a teacher in grooming an individual. I would like to place on record the efforts put in by our team Fiki under the able leadership of our very own president, Ms. Sangeeta Reddy, who is leading us from front and her advice on lifelong fitness will definitely take us to different places and will give us an opportunity to build India as a, as a sporting nation. Mr. Dilip Chanoy and everyone at the Fiki Secret who has worked hard to make this event as a memorable one, especially Pankaj and his team, I am sure that they have put in their best to create this event as a memorable and a successful event for all of us. On behalf of Sports and Youth Affairs Committee of FIKI, I thank all partners, Star India, MPL, Dream 11, 
partner state Jharkhand and Odisha and all our exhibitors for their support and contribution towards TURF 2020. The excellent summary provided by each of you will help us, the sports sector stakeholders, to plan what we need to do next, both here in FIKI and in India. I once again would like to thank all of you for your time, your contribution and your guidance to FIKI and to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bhalla. And thank you once again to all our esteemed dignitaries, Honorable Minister, for this wonderful inaugural session, for gracing this inaugural session. We'll be starting now with our brainstorming uh, sessions. And uh, Honorable Minister has also said that he's, uh, he's very excited to see the range of topics and the eminent panel that we have for these sessions. So uh, we would be just starting with our brainstorming sessions. Right now, once again, thank you to all the dignitaries for gracing this inaugural session of Pick it up 2020. Thank you.